Hi, everybody. Welcome to Church Online. We want you to know that we miss you and we look forward to the day when we can all be together again, enjoy a coffee and uh, just have some great fellowship with one another. Yes, welcome to Church Online. Glad you joined us today. It's pretty cold this weekend, so I hope you're all tucked up at home, nice and warm. I've got a coffee here, but we're so looking forward to you coming back. Look, no sandwiches, no people, but it's on its way. Let's trust God. This thing's going to be over soon, but in the meantime, let's worship God together. Let's enjoy the Word together. So really enter in today. The team's done such a good job again of preparing the worship for us. Come, let's worship God together today. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Amen. I believe in signs and wonder. I have resurrection power. Testimony from death to life, cause grace we wrote my story. I testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I justify this is my testimony. This is my testimony. When we come together, we sing. Together, sons and daughters, but we're blood and washing water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what is started. Yes, our God will finish what is started. Jesus. 
Jesus. We honor you, Lord. Thank you, God. Greater things are still to come, God. You're not done with us, Jesus. It's not over, God, until you say it's over, God. Thank you, Lord. We put all our trust, all our hope is in you, Jesus. We look to you in this moment, God. Not on our fears, not on our pain, but to you, God. We honor you in this moment, God. We worship you. Send your revival, God, of our land, of our homes, God. It's like a river wash over me. Immerse me in water as deep as the sea. Thank you've done it before, but 
church how amazing is it that we can worship together and I love the words to the song that we just sung that we ask God to pour out his presence because where his presence is their change can happen despite what's happening in our lives despite the situation God's done it before and he can do it again that's right and isn't it great to know that God always hears our prayers no matter what we might be facing or going through we can always lift it up to him so as we get ready for the service today we're going to commit all of our prayers to him and um, Chris is going to lead us. Before we pray, can I remind you of the life of Joshua? And you read the book of Joshua in the Bible. He took the children of Israel from where they were, the wilderness, to God's promised land, to their new way of living. And right at the start, right throughout the book, God constantly reminds Joshua and the children of Israel to one, obey his commandments, but two, be strong and courageous. So I'm going to trust that we will build our faith up and we may have our faith, but we need courage to take that step of faith as we continue on through life. So let's pray and lift our knees up to God. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the God who is in control. Thank you that you're the God who has a plan and a purpose for our lives. So today as we come towards you and we, and we say, Lord, please would you bless our lives. Uh, give us provision of hope and of, and of faith if we're lacking that, but also give us a provision of resources. Lord, we pray for health challenges. We pray you'd protect us from the virus and everything that's happening. But more than that, any other diagnosis, any other things that are happening as we enter the flu season and our immune systems are compromised, we pray that you would be the great physician in our lives, that you would do only what you can, that you protect us, that you would heal us. Lord, we pray for the, the students going back to school. We pray that you would keep, uh, keep protection, but help us finish the academic year strong. Father, we pray for businesses that might be in trouble. We pray that you would be the rescuer of our businesses, the savior of not just our lives, but all aspects in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, welcome to another great Sunday online, Rivers Church Online. It's so great to have you join us. And if it's your very first time, an extra special welcome to you. We have an online brochure on our website, rivers.church. So be sure to check that out if um, you haven't joined us for a service before. It'll tell you everything you could ever possibly wonder about Rivers Church, more information about our campuses and some of our ministries. For example, KidZone, who are also having services today. Yeah, that's right, Kids Zone. If you don't know, it's our children's church ministry. They uh, they have services that run online. So maybe after the service, if you don't have another device, you can put that on. Um, or if you have another device at home, why not jump into the website and they can enjoy church while we enjoy church together. Another great thing about the website is there's a whole bunch of information on, on stuff that's coming up. And we'd love to pray with you. You can tell us what you're praying and you're trusting God for. Tell us what you're celebrating. It's all there on the website. So if you have a little bit of time after the service, why not jump on there and connect with us online? 
and also our sisters magazine which came out two weeks ago so if you haven't read that be sure to check that out and something very special happening this Friday is a youth and young adults meeting with a guest Jedediah Thurner. We're actually having a combined night this Friday with youth and young adults and uh, Jedediah Thurner is from the US we had a zoom call with him in fact I'm gonna stop talking take a look at the promo and find out more. And I am so excited to be with you. That's right, this Friday at 7 p.m. with the Rivers Youth and Young Adults, we have our combined night, an incredible conversation with me and Pastor Chris. Man, I think we shared some stuff that you're gonna wanna hear, don't miss it. Bring your friends into this conversation, go to rivers.church or all social media platforms, find out how you can get connected, invite someone, join the conversation. Can't wait to see you there, 7 p.m. this Friday. Let's do it. Well, hello, church. We've come to a very cheerful part of the service here today because it's an opportunity for us to give with joy. And I'd like to encourage you from a portion of scripture that we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and it says this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this was not as expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. The Macedonian church was facing a severe test of affliction. They had overwhelming poverty, and yet their lives overflowed with joy. I know that as our lives have joy, if we have the perspective and the anchor of joy, it doesn't matter the circumstances around us, we can weather anything. And the act of giving is an act of joy. And so I wanna share with you just five quick reasons why we must give with joy today like the Macedonian church. The first reason is because it means that we are playing our part with purpose. The people in Macedonia, in those churches, they knew that they had a small part to play. And even though what they gave was small, they were determined that they were going to give it because it gave their lives purpose. They had joy because of purpose. Now, we can't be together in church like we normally are, but we can still have purpose in our giving. We can still play our part because that leads us to the second reason why we must give with joy. It's because it means that we are bringing relief to others. There is joy in knowing that our giving is playing a part in making a difference in other people's lives. And you may not have seen the stories that we have seen, but every single week we hear story upon story upon story and praise report upon praise report about how lives were lifted through the worship, how people were encouraged by the preaching, how they made decisions to stay in their marriages, to fight for their family. They made decisions to keep on going because of the ministry that they have received. And you need to know that your giving has played a part in that. So thank you. Thank you for playing your part. Thank you for bringing relief to others. The third reason why we must give with joy is because we fulfill God's will. It says in verse five that they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Every time we are obedient to God, every time we honor Him, every time we put Him first in our lives, there is joy that comes with it, confidence and peace that comes with it. And even in the midst of a severe trial, even in the midst of difficulty, we see the widow with Elijah. We see the widow who gave her two small copper coins. We see the church of Macedonia who fulfilled God's will for their lives. There was joy that overflowed despite the severe circumstances. The fourth reason is because God's promises never fail. We have joy because God's promises never fail. His promises for provision, His promises for security. And throughout scripture, we read about how when we give, God gives back to us. In fact, even in the next chapter, chapter nine of 2 Corinthians, we read that those who sow abundantly will reap abundantly. We know that God says that there'll be seed time and harvest. And now this may not be a season of harvest for us, but it certainly is a season of sowing. And God promises that as we sow, we will reap. And the final reason why we must give with joy is because joy begets joy. As we sow joy, we reap joy. As we invest joy, we get joy. As we give joy, we receive joy. Church, as we embrace the joy of giving today, we are bringing greater levels of joy in our lives. 
And as we have more joy, there's no doubt that we will overcome severe trials. I hope that encourages you today, church. You can take a moment to give if you haven't already done so. Some details are going to pop up on the screen. You can give via EFT uh, through SnapScan as well. You'll see the barcode appearing. You can also give via the Rivers Church app. It's a quick, safe and easy way to give. Church, let's take a moment to pray together. Father, we thank you that we get to participate in this incredible act of giving. Thank you that this giving brings joy to our lives and relief to God's people. Thank you that our giving gives glory to you. Father, I pray for every person giving today that you'd meet every need, provide for every lack. In this season of difficulty, I pray that you would restore joy and hope. And I pray that we would truly see the evidence of your working through our giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. As we come around the Word today, I've got an interesting topic that I want to address with you today that I think is extremely important. And so let's take a moment to pray. Father, I pray that you'd open the hearts and minds of people today so they can be receptive to your truth, receptive to what you want to say, and receptive to the way they need to go forward, speak into every life and into every heart, and heal our relationships in our homes, in our churches, and in our world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, you know, it's very interesting. I was reading that it's not easy to apologize. I don't know about you, but most people find it incredibly difficult to apologize. Why is it so difficult to apologize? Well, it turns out that it, our pride gets in the way. It goes against our pride. We have to humble ourselves when we say sorry. The Japanese have found a way around it, and they've uh, developed these agencies where people actually go and apologize on your behalf. You can actually pay an agency, and then they will either send an email, or they'll go personally, and they'll uh, and apologize. And they say in that way, you can avoid the discomfort of having to apologize yourself. And you pay something like 3,500 Rand for a full-on apology. You pay a bit more if they add crying to it, or if they just send an email, it's 1,500 Rand for that apology. And they get you out of sticky situations where your pride might be affected. You know, pride is a sin that's very difficult to overcome. And the reason it's difficult to overcome is because we can so easily see it in others, but we can't see it in ourselves. And you'll remember in the Bible where James and John, their mom went to Jesus and asked, can my son sit one on your left and one on your right? Talk about asking for a favor. And then the Bible says when the 12 heard about it, they were indignant. Why? Because their pride was hurt. Firstly, the boys wanted to be in those prideful positions. But then when the others heard about it, they were like, we should have sent our mother. So pride is a very tricky thing. And I'm going to speak on it today, not because I'm an expert, not because I'm, I'm humble, because the minute you say you're humble, well, then you're in pride. But I want to speak on it because it's very important for us to address. And I want to say a number of things, read a few scriptures, and then give you some practical ways today. So the title of the message is Overcoming the Pride Trap. Overcoming the Pride Trap. Now, a man called Ezra Taft Benson, Secretary of Agriculture in the States at one time, he said, pride is a sin that can readily be seen in others, but is rarely admitted in ourselves. Isn't that true? We say, can so seldom see our, our pride, but everyone else's pride shouts out at us. But we do need to be careful that we don't fall into the pride trap. And I want to remind you today, especially in light of what's happening in our world, that racism is born out of pride. People say that it comes from a system, and I don't want to disagree with that, but I think it comes from the human heart, and it is essentially born out of pride. And when we don't fall into the pride trap, then we can avoid this issue of racism. G.K. Chesterton, the author and theologian, said this. He said, if I had one sermon to preach, it would be a sermon against pride. Did you know God actually hates pride? And in fact, the Bible says he opposes the proud. So, you know, if you think of what God hates, and if you think of what he opposes, he doesn't oppose rich people, he doesn't oppose weak people, he doesn't oppose failures. No, he opposes the proud. And there are a number of verses concerning this. Proverbs 15, verse 25, notice what it says. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but he protects the property of widows. Proverbs 16 and verse 5, the Lord detests, strong word, detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, he says. In other words, take note, be sure of this, they will not go and punished. It's almost like God will go after them. Pretty serious things. I think we need to pay attention to it. And it's the first on the list of the seven deadly sins, as mentioned, 
by uh, Pope Gregory the Great. Now, if it's the first on the list, I believe the reason for that is because it's the root of all other sins. That's why God hates it so much. James chapter 4 and verse 6 in the New Testament says, as the scripture says, referring to Proverbs 3, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. The Greek word here is, is interesting, antitasomai. It's almost that God is, is at enmity with you when you're proud. He, he, will go, he will go against you and go at you when you're proud, but when you humble yourself, which is personal responsibility, then God suddenly comes and it says he'll lift you up. So the way up is actually the way down. Again, you're in 1 Peter. Peter's speaking about this. Again, James and Peter in the New Testament. Peter says, and all of you, dress yourselves in humility. It says in the J.B. Phillips, put on the overall of humility. Some Greek translations say the apron. So you've got to put on a humble serving spirit and you've got to clothe yourself with it. Don't pretend, don't just put it on your face. You've got to have it from your heart. And then he says, as you relate to one another, because pride is the greatest damaging factor in relationships. He says, for God opposes the pride. He's against the pride, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God that at the right time he'll lift you up in honor. So many people seek honor, but the way to honor is to humble yourself. And um, pride's not the same as having confidence. Confidence is a very good thing. But confidence and arrogance is a fine line between them. And Webster's English Dictionary defines pride as inordinate self-esteem. In other words, it's too high. An unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority. That's where you get racism, that feeling of inordinate superiority because of your color of your skin. In talents, beauty, wealth, accomplishments, rank or elevation in office, which manifests itself, watch this, in lofty airs, distance, so you never get near to certain people, reserve, and often in contempt of others. I like that definition because it talks about lofty airs. And in fact, again, in the book of Proverbs chapter 6, the Lord hates lofty airs. Notice the strong language here in Proverbs 6. There are six things the Lord hates. Then he says, no, seven, he detests. Strong words. And the first one on the list, haughty eyes. So to walk around with an inordinate self-esteem, to think you're so much better than everyone else, because of what you've accomplished, because of your wealth, because of the color of your skin, he says, yeah, God actually hates that. So how many of you know, we've got to be careful we don't fall into the pride trap, because if it's the first sin and it's the root of all other sins, then we're all susceptible to it. And you can have pride of face, pride of place, pride of race, pride of what you own, who you know, what you know, and you've got to be careful because so much of what we accomplish when we're successful leads to pride. That's why people hate rich people often. It's not because of their money. It's because of the spirit with which they project themselves because of what they've got and because of what they know. And Paul writing in his letter to the Corinthians, he says this. He says, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. In other words, don't think you know so much and don't be puffed up with what you know because that's what separates people in relationships and it's an inordinate self-esteem. It's not good and God actually hates it. You can always tell when people have knowledge and they want to impress you because they pour out their knowledge and they want to show you how stupid you are and how clever they are. You can even pick this up from preachers. You can tell when a preacher wants to impress you with their knowledge or whether they want to help you. And, and you can pick this up very quickly because it's a spirit of pride. I'm good. I'm clever. I know the Greek. I know the Hebrew. Listen to me. No, it's about helping people. The pride trap can be fallen into by everybody, including Christian leaders. So let me give you some practical things on how to overcome pride today. Six things that we need to do. Number one, don't fall into the devil's pride trap. Don't fall into the devil's pride trap. Did you know that the first sin in the world was pride, not murder. We always think that, you know, Cain murdered Abel. No, no, before that, the devil fell into pride. God created him beautiful, gave him a lofty position, but he fell into pride. And uh, Lucifer, the name Lucifer means light bearer. Lucifer was so full of light and beauty that it went to his head. And that's what happens to people today. Their beauty becomes the thing that goes to their head. They forget that one day they're going to lose their beauty. They're going to get old and they're going to die. But in the meantime, they separate themselves from God. 
and they get into the pride trap. And it's the devil's pride trap that most people, as, as I look around the world, most people are falling into today. So Ezekiel chapter 28 talks about this. And Isaiah 14, I want to read to you uh, of how this happens so that we can understand this dynamic. The, the Lord speaking here about Satan. He says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your heart was filled with pride because of your beauty. And he says, your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. In other words, God created you. He gave you everything that you were. He made you incredibly beautiful. And it went to your head. And now you wanted it to be all about you. And in fact, your looks were so wonderful that you now wanted to be worshipped for your looks. Does that remind you of anything that's going on in our world today? People posting themselves on social media wanting to be worshipped just because of the looks that God gave them. It's the pride trap of the devil. Isaiah chapter 14, again relating about Satan. It says, for you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven. I will set my throne above God's stars. I'll preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I'll climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. In other words, I'll be a God myself and people will worship me. Instead, you will be brought down because God opposes the proud. Don't forget that. To the place of the dead down to its lowest depths. You see, that's the principle Jesus explained. You exalt yourself, you get pulled down. Humble yourself, you get lifted up. And he says, everyone will stare at you and ask, can this be the one who shook the earth and made the kingdoms of the world tremble? Is this the one who destroyed the world and made it a wasteland? You see, they'll be so shocked at how low you've been brought down because of the way you exalt yourself. And that's been the, 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 the way Satan has been reduced to a place of confinement and will end up in a place called hell. Now, you know, when I think of this whole picture here, it reminds me so much of what's happening to people on social media. They're basically posting pictures and saying, look how gifted and how beautiful I am. Look at my legs, look at my feet, look at my shoes, look at my clothing. Don't you think my shoes are amazing? Don't you think I'm mad? And, and, and we just promote ourselves and we've got to be careful that we don't fall into the devil's pride trap where we think we're so beautiful, so good looking. We have so much. Everyone ought to worship us. No, they ought to worship God. And we need, need to have a place where we put ourselves in the right position. You see, Paul noticed that people were using their gifts to promote themselves and they were glorying in themselves. So he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, he says, what do you have that God hasn't given you? In other words, you are not self-made. Everything you have, your beauty, your gift, come from God. And he says this, he says, and if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? In other words, you're basically saying, praise me, praise me, look at me, look how great I am. But now we use our gifts and that which God has given us. We've been born with certain things and we dominate and feel superior and we make other people feel inferior. That's what the devil did. And we got a God against the trap of Satan, which is pride. Number two, the second thing today that we need to do in order to overcome the pride trap, and all of us need to do this, including myself, is stay humble when you're successful. See, it's very easy to be humble when you're nothing, because you are nothing and you know you're nothing. But when you become successful, you start having money and clothing and houses and cars. It can go to your head and you can start to behave as though you are now not open to correction anymore. In my book, 12 Things That Undermine Our Success, I've written an entire chapter right at the end called The Trap of the successful. Because I've noticed that when you become successful and you become an achiever and you acquire wealth, knowledge, and there, there are things that you've done that people respect, you can, you can become blind to your own faults and you fall into what I call the trap of the successful. And you've got to be careful, especially when you get older, you've had a lot of success and you go, oh, younger people, you know this young generation. You, you, you write off young people as though young people know nothing just because of what you've achieved and because you're older. You've got to be careful when you're young and you're highly educated and successful as a young person that you don't write off older people. Oh, what do they know? They're old. Look at them. No, pride comes when success comes. And we've got to guard that. God gives us success, but pride enters our hearts. And we, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can become so proud that we're not open to correction. And we become obnoxious people. People actually dislike proud people. And I've noticed that, uh, that when you come from a poor background as well, you come from a humble, poor background, and now you achieve success and wealth, 
you can walk around wanting to let everyone know just how successful you are. Look at, you know, do you know how much these shoes cost? Do you know how much this watch costs? Do you know how I only wear branded clothing? What are you trying to prove? You've got into pride through success. And the Bible says God opposes that, but he gives grace to the humble. But the biggest thing is this, is we've got to remember that we're just ordinary people and that God has blessed us. You know, there's a wonderful basketball player in America. He now plays for the Beijing Ducks, but his career was mostly in America, Jeremy Lin. And he said this, I love this, he's a Christian. He says, I struggle with pride every day. But the one thing that I try to remind myself every day is that I'm still a sinner, no matter how many points, assists, wins I get on the court. He says, you know what, I'm famous, people applaud me, they think I'm amazing, but I've got to remember I'm just an ordinary person because I don't want the success and the money and the fame to go to my head. You know, the Bible's full of stories like that, so we need to take note. King Asa, King Uzziah, two kings that trusted God, depended on God, but both ended up later in their lives falling into pride because of the success God gave them, and then God had to deal with them and judge them, and uh, their end was not as great as the beginning. And pride also entered into the heart of King David. King David became so successful, he won so many battles that he felt he didn't need to fight anymore. He stayed at home, and the Bible tells us he saw Bathsheba. She was the wife of one of his best friends, one of his mighty men, and without a thought, he took her. In his pride, he thought he could take another man's wife. He thought he could kill that man and get away with it. And no one would say anything because he applied different rules to himself. It's amazing how you can be so aware of other people's sins. But when you're in pride, you don't see your own sins. Well, well, I'm successful. I can do no wrong. And that's how King David was. Nathan the prophet approaches David and challenges him. And actually, this is very interesting. He uses a story to speak to David. He starts to tell King David a story. He says, you know, there's a man who had a lamb and this lamb was his only lamb and he loved this lamb and he cradled this lamb in his arms. But then a rich man came along and took his only lamb and killed his lamb and he ate it for a meal when he had a whole lot of lambs of his own. And David listens to the story and I want you to notice his response because David's response to this story is very, very important today as we consider the pride trap. 2 Samuel 12 and verse 5, it says, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. And he sees, you see, he sees the wrong in others, but he doesn't see it in himself. He must pay for that lamb four times over. Notice, he attacks the person. He doesn't just comment on it and say, well, you need to do it. He attacks the person and he says, because he did such a thing and had no pity, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. You see, when you're successful, you don't see your mistakes anymore. You don't see your pride. You only see that in others. And you think, man, you know, I'm never wrong. I'm always right. And you end up attacking others. John Maxwell put it like this, and I think this is a brilliant quote. He says, pride deafens us to the advice or warnings of those around us. When you're full of pride on the inside, it makes you stiff, stubborn, and creates strife with others. You know, pride can blind you when you're successful. And you can become self-righteous. And I do believe that on social media today, that's a huge problem. You've got successful people. They've got a number of followers. People like them. Maybe they've got their own YouTube channel. So they start to attack everyone around them. And, and they almost want to call everyone out as though they are perfect and untouchable. That's because they've become successful. They've entered into pride. But they forget this one thing. All of us are sinners and all of us have got weaknesses. And God help you. If you keep attacking other people in your pride, thinking you're perfect, you will one day be called out and then you'll be humiliated. And that humiliation is extremely hard to recover from. There are the traps that we can fall into. The trap of success, the trap of Satan, number three, never look down on other races. You can see in our world today that we've got a massive problem because people look down on other people purely because of the color of their skin. And really it all stems from pride, feeling that you're superior to someone else. And that makes people feel inferior and that causes hostility and it's caused a massive problem in our world. Racism was actually the cause of the Second World War. Hitler had this ideology and he pursued it and, 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 and millions of Jews were exterminated purely because of the shape of their faces. They looked very similar, but there were certain features about them 
And Hitler exterminated people because of that. And that it comes from pride. I'm better than you, and, and, and you're less than me. And th that's caused tremendous hurt in our world, and it all stems from pride. And any race that feels superior is caught in pride, no matter what color you are. Now, in Romans chapter 12, it says this, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And Paul goes on to talk about the fact that we're one body. So we shouldn't think we're better than other people purely because of some gifting or something we're born with. We need to respect everyone because we're meant to be one body. We're meant to be one community. We're meant to be one nation, especially as a church. We're meant to link together. And if you think of this, pride destroys every relationship. It destroys marriages. People can't humble themselves and say they're wrong. It destroys families, it destroys churches, and it destroys nations, and it has separated our world. And, you know, if you go back into the Bible, you'll see that racism has been dealt with. It's not something new. The Bible gives us clear, clear pointers on it, and uh, the Jews believed that Gentiles were inferior, and they actually were known as dogs. And it was a deeply rooted thing. It was even in the Apostle Peter's life. And when the gospel came to the early church, the Jews felt they were saved, but the Gentiles weren't saved. It was a racial issue, and God had to speak to Peter and reveal himself to Peter because Peter was dealing with a race issue. In Acts chapter 10, if you go there, you can read about it, and you'll see the pride of the Jewish nation was so deeply rooted, God gives Peter this vision. Acts chapter 10, it says, Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or in unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So God's saying, don't ever think that you're better than someone else, cleaner than them, better than them, cleverer than them. Don't call what I've created unclean. Go and reach the Gentiles with the gospel. Go and reach other people, groups. And, and it's interesting. Why did God have to give Peter a vision? Visions are not frequent in the New Testament. They're not dime a dozen. You don't see them every day. But God has to give him a story, if you like, a parable so that he gets the point. Just like with David, Nathan had to come with a story and then... David got it. And here the Lord comes with a vision so that Peter understands, hey, the, the, he's talking about animals here, and, but Peter gets the point, ah. And so God uses the story to get Peter's attention because Peter was so caught up in racism because the Jewish nation was stuck with us that he then gets the point and the gospel goes out to the Gentiles. We've got to be very, very, very careful in our world today because racial tension is causing such strife. And, you know, sometimes, like, like with Nathan, a story was told. Like with Peter, a vision was given, a story was told. Maybe the George Floyd situation is the story that the world needs today so that we get the point because some people just don't seem to get the point. And we should never look down on other races because it separates and God doesn't want us separated. He wants to bring people together. In, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, let me remind you what Jesus did. It says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles, different peoples, into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. See, Jesus humbled himself on the cross. Even though he was the king of glory, he didn't wear pride. He humbled himself, the Bible says in Philippians, unto death. And then you remember when he rode into Jerusalem, he rode in on a donkey. Why a donkey? A donkey, the Bible says, that hadn't even been ridden. So in the category of donkeys, this was way, way down, a beast of burden. He didn't come like a typical king with a chariot. Look, here I am. I'm going to do something amazing. I'm going to die on the cross. No, Jesus came to bring races together, peoples together. And in order to do that, he humbled himself. That's how God brings people together. When you humble yourself and you say, I'm not better than you. I need to learn from you. I need to listen to you. We need to find each other. That's when people come together. You know, Martin Luther told a very interesting story once. He spoke about when he was walking on a mountain pass, a very narrow trail along the side of a mountain, and he came across two mountain goats. Now, mountain goats are very aggressive. They normally butt heads. And he said, as the one was coming from the one side and the other one was coming from the other side, he thought to himself, oh, my gosh, this is going to end badly. One of them is going to die. The other one's going to be injured. And they're going to bang their heads until they knock one off the mountainside and the other one can pass. And he said, as he waited and watched, 
he noticed something amazing happen. The one mountain goat lay down on the ground and it let the other one walk over him in order to pass and go on his way. Then that goat got up and walked on. And you know, sometimes in order to bring racial reconciliation, we need to humble ourselves and just lie down for a moment and just take a pause and listen to people so that we can all go on our way in this world. Let's not fall into the pride trap today. Let me move forward. Number four, and I hope this is helping you today, and I hope it's speaking into your situation, and I hope you're receiving from God, from his word today, which is so important. Number four, don't fall into the pride trap of social media. Now, I've spoken on this before, but I do believe today I need to just touch on this again, because pride is that which seeks recognition, and social media is all about getting yourself out there. And people say, well, isn't that good? Shouldn't we get out there? And isn't the way of connecting? And, you know, people have got themselves out there, and they've got famous, and they've got rich. I don't think Christians should be seeking recognition. We should be seeking to glorify God, and we've got to be careful, because social media is a trap. And if we're not careful, we will end up in pride and vanity. And Christians should not fall into pride and vanity. I'm amazed at how many people promote themselves on social media. And I'll say it, I've said it before, I'll say it again. People list themselves as as public figures on Instagram and they've only got like a handful of followers. Is is that the future that they're declaring? Or do they see themselves as that? Or they want people to see themselves as that? I think we've got to be very careful because the nature of pride is such that we want people to worship us. So we put ourselves on social media, we put pictures of ourselves and we say, look at me, worship me, aren't I amazing? And I think it's an obsession that we can get caught up in and I think it's a very dangerous thing. In the wonderful book by Kerry Newoff called Didn't See It Coming, Kerry talks about a man called Tim Elmore, great speaker and leader part of the John Maxwell organization. And uh, the book, Didn't See It Coming, talks a lot about things people don't see coming. One of them is pride, but he speaks about Tim Elmore and quotes Tim Elmore. And uh, Tim Elmore has studied the generations, and he's got a a real good handle on on life and on people and on, on the generations. And Tim Elmore says that narcissism is on the rise among young adults and kids. And he says, you know, that obsession with self. And he says, in the 1950s, if you ask someone, are you a very important person? He said, in the 1950s, 10% of people would say, oh, I'm a very important person. He said, well, you just bring it 50, 70 years later, 80% of young people who are asked, who haven't achieved anything, think they're very important people. And he says, it's that obsession with self that is permeating our world. And he says, it causes this high arrogance and yet low self-esteem. So people don't feel good, but they've got a high sense of arrogance. I should be loved and respected. I am somebody, which is really pride. But actually, at the root of it, they've got low self-esteem. That's why they need to be liked all the time. They need to keep posting all the time. And we can get caught up in this trap of trying to be someone. And he says this. Tim Elmo actually says, the problem here is parents keep telling their kids that they're amazing, like, you're brilliant, you're awesome. Uh, The kid does something small, tells them you're incredible. And he says, what they've done is you're telling people they're amazing when they haven't achieved anything. So as a result, they start to think too much of themselves. They never admit their faults because they think they're perfect. And he says, and this ends up on social media and it's it's a whole self-perpetuating thing. And you know, Jesus spoke directly opposite to this. In fact, in Luke chapter 14, we don't have time to read it, but the Bible says that Jesus noticed that people were looking for the best seats. They wanted the seats of honor at uh, the wedding banquets. They were looking to be prominent, to be recognized. And he said, no, don't don't choose those seats because if you take those seats, someone's going to come and ask you to move and then you're going to feel terrible. But he says, actually, if you choose the lower seats, they'll come and say, hey, why are you sitting here? And they'll bring you and they'll put you in the good seats. So he says, don't, don't try and self-promote. Rather be humble and then God will promote you and you'll end up in places of prominence. And, you know, people advertise themselves and promote themselves just like the devil. Look at my beauty, you know. But have they achieved anything worthy of respect? Well, beauty is one thing, but character is much more important. And in the world today, the prevailing attitude is one of pride. I don't have time to read it today, but 2 Timothy chapter 3 talks about this, that in the last days that people will be proud, they'll be obsessed with themselves, and I think we see it on social media. And you know, it's so easy, even as Christians, to end up in pride where we don't no longer see our faults. There's been a lot of emphasis on grace in, in, in the Christian world, in the teaching, and I think it's been a very good thing. But you know, Jesus spoke 
in Luke's gospel, chapter 18, and he, he mentions a, a, a Pharisee and a tax collector coming into the temple. And he says, the Pharisee said, I'm not like other men. You know, I'm, I'm just about perfect, you know. I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do that, you know. And I don't burn fossil fuels and, you know, and I don't eat meat and I'm a vegetarian and I don't drive a car that's got a big engine, that's got high emissions. And he just went on about how, and then he, he says, the tax collector said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. In other words, he recognized I'm not as good as I would like to be. And the Bible says, Jesus said, the tax collector went away justified, but the Pharisee went away condemned because if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. But if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. So we need to be very careful of this whole trap of social media. And what I've noticed is, is when sometimes when people have sat under a lot of grace teaching and you try and correct them, they say this, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. Well, we all need to be people who admit our mistakes. And I think on social media, you present the best and you hide the rest. Number five, the fifth thing quickly is this. We need to remember to give glory to God for everything. You know, when you're a thankful person and a grateful person, pride seems to go. A prideful person usually thinks they're not getting what they deserve. That's why they're not grateful. Someone gives them something, oh, thank you. Someone gives them a birthday gift, oh. They don't, some people don't say anything. Why? Because they're not grateful because they think they deserve more. You should have spent more on me. But a grateful person is grateful for anything. And we need a spirit of gratitude. And the Bible teaches us here in Colossians chapter 3. It says, always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And then he says, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks through him to God the Father. Always give thanks to God for everything in your life. When you achieve something, give thanks to God and, and always give him the glory. Uh, in 1 Peter, Peter speaking here says, if anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised. They shouldn't serve to get recognition to show how great they are. You know, I've got a friend in Polokwane, Pastor Joseph and Kotra, and he runs a wonderful church with his wife, Cordelia. And you know, whenever he posts something about his church and they had a great service on the weekend and things were going really well, he always says, and God gets the glory. He never forgets to give God the glory because he knows pride can easily seep into our hearts and trap us. And we've got to be very careful that we don't take the glory for ourselves, especially when we serve others, because God deserves the credit. People often come to me and compliment and say good things, you know, when we used to be in the church foyer and even on Instagram, and you know, you need to say thank you, and also say I'm glad you were helped, because the goal is not impressing, but helping people. Pride so easily lurks at the door of our lives. Let me come to a close with number six, the sixth thing that we need when we deal with the subject of pride, and we don't want to fall into the pride trap, is never think you know better than God. You know, the minute you think you know better than God, man, you've fallen into the pride trap, and that's when trouble begins to come into our lives. Pride is basically independence from God. The, the devil thought he knew better than God, didn't need God, and so chose to live apart from God and set himself up as an enemy of God. And that's what people do today. I'm so clever. I'm so strong. I'm so wise. I know so much. I studied science. I don't need God. And we can think that we're better than God. And we move into arrogance. We move into pride. You know, Pope Benedict XVI made a, c a comment once. And he said the Greek world was very deeply aware that man's real sin, his deepest temptation is hubris, the arrogant presumption of autonomy that leads a man to put on the airs of divinity to claim to be his own God. In other words, I don't need God, I know so much. And we carry that kind of air of superiority. And he says, in order to possess life totally and to draw from it every last drop of what it has to offer, this awareness that man's true peril consists in the temptation to ostentatious self-sufficiency. Well, quite a bit of words there, but what he's saying is we think we're so amazing that we end up with this ostentatious self-sufficiency. And he says, this is man's real problem. He wants to really be a God, and he thinks he knows better than God. And really, if you boil it down, that was the trap of Satan. Satan believed that he didn't need God. Pride is actually independence of God. I'm clever, I'm strong, I'm intelligent, I've studied science, I know it all. 
And you know, while you're thinking like that, you're not open to God. The great author C.S. Lewis in his wonderful book, Mere Christianity, he said this, he said, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. That's so, so true. We need to sometimes take a moment to have a look at our lives and uh, to reevaluate ourselves and then to look up and to say, God, I need you. I don't have it all. I'm not self-sufficient. I may currently be strong. And you know, sometimes when you're strong and you're healthy and you're young and you're beautiful or you're handsome, you think, man, nothing can touch me. But wait till you get sick. Wait till you become vulnerable. Then suddenly your pride goes and then humility comes. Don't wait until then. Rather humble yourself because when you humble yourself, that's when your relationship with God can be restored and your relationship with people can be restored too. As I close today, I want to encourage us to really look at this topic of pride and examine ourselves because pride always divides people. I think the problem in the world today between races, between peoples, between husbands and wives, pride. So let's start as we close here. When it comes to other races, how do we get on with other races? I think the best thing to do is to humble yourself. Humble yourself, don't think you're better, and then reach out. And you find when there's humility, people always come together. When there's understanding, people always come together. And we can be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Then when it comes to our relationship with God, you see humility brings people together, heals that relationship, but our relationship with God also gets healed when we humble. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Don't think you know better. And when you do, the Bible says he will lift you up. So how do you become a Christian? You say, I'm wrong, Lord, and you're right. I humble myself under your wisdom. I humble myself and accept that Jesus is the only way. I humble myself and admit I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. Lord, I come to you humbly. The Bible says he forgives and he will lift you up, literally up into heaven. He saves you and then when you die, you go up into glory. The way up is the way down. And if we're going to heal racial relationships, going to heal our relationship with God, it's going to take humility. So if today you say, I want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, let me pray with you, especially in the area of race relations, but especially in the area of your relationship with God. Father, we come to you today and we bring our hearts to you. And none of us is perfect. None of us has, has no pride in our lives. It's something that we all struggle with, but we bring you our hearts today. And we, we humble ourselves. We don't ask you to humble us. We humble ourselves. And we say, Lord, we want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So use us to build uh, relationships with different races, with different peoples, and for us to bring healing to our nation, to our land, and to our world. Then, Lord, when it comes to our relationship with you, we admit we need you. We admit we are sinners. We humble ourselves. And we confess, yes, we're not so amazing as we think we are. We might be attractive or rich or educated or clever or successful, but we need your salvation. So we humble ourselves and we accept your means of salvation, which is Jesus, and we invite him into our lives. Now we ask, Lord, would you lift us up? Would you give us grace, salvation, and deliverance? And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you prayed with me there, and uh, you invited Jesus into your life, you'd like to humble yourself and avail yourselves of God's means of salvation, then go onto our website. There's some information. You've prayed with me today, but that's just the first step. Now you need to make the journey of salvation, and you need to look to God to direct you. And we've got a whole lot of advice there, and we'd love to hear from you. So go onto the website and avail yourselves of that. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the Word today, and I hope you've received some benefit from us studying the Scriptures together. The Bible has the answer for every problem that we're facing, and we always need to go there first before we resort to social media, before we go and look for any help anywhere else. That's the first place to get our guidance. So until next time, look forward to being with you next week. God bless you.